Here at The Regenerative Journey, we know that good health is related to good food and good practices, but understand that sometimes the right food choices are quite hard to put into place. But our good buddy, Cindy O'Meara at The Nutrition Academy is helping people break old habits to create a much healthier lifestyle. So in support of what she's doing, we're offering a $100 discount to all our listeners. Simply enroll in their functional nutrition course and enter the coupon CHARLIE100, that's CHARLIE100, The Nutrition Academy. Say goodbye to old food habits and hello to a much healthier, happier life. I mean, life's a journey and, you you know, I think it's just full of different discoveries and I discovered that about myself and I'm so glad. And now I I know that, um, you know, when I get a bit stressed and when things really start to get a bit out of control, I, I know I need to go out in nature and just reground myself. That was Melissa Brown and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and internationally and their continuing connection to country, culture, community, land, sea and sky. And we pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott, an 8th generational Australian regenerative farmer. And in this podcast series, I'll be diving deep and exploring my guests' unique perspectives on the world so you can apply their experience and knowledge to cultivate your own transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with your host, Charlie Arnott. Don't forget our spring Intro to Biodynamics workshops are coming up fast. We are at Hanamino in Borowa in New South Wales on the 7th and 8th of October, then travel to Victoria in mid-October, Tasmania in late October, with our last workshop for the year in the beautiful Margaret River in WA during late November. All are welcome, urban gardeners, broadacre farmers, graziers, viticulturists alike. No previous experience required as Hamish and Charlie cover it all. For more details, check out our website www.charliearnett.com .com.au and follow the events link. G'day, this week's episode is with Melissa Brown of Gem Tree Wines down there in the McLaren Vale in South Australia. I had the pleasure of sitting with her outside her house on a little patio there overlooking the uh, the grapes or some of their grapes, sheep grazing underneath, birds chirping, all sorts of wonderful things. We talked about Melissa's life, her, her um uh, how she actually got back onto got onto her father's farm and took that over and introduced biodynamics and they've, how they've gone on from strength to strength using regenerative practices, um, her own personal journey. Um, and it was just just a delightful chat with Melissa there. It was pretty quick. It was uh, just before um, the beginning. It was in the morning of day two of our introduction to biodynamics course we had down there with her um, back a few months ago now when we can travel. Uh, but I hope you enjoy this interview with Melissa, Melissa Brown as much as I did. Hello, Melissa Brown. Hi, Charlie. You're um, you're on the regenerative journey, and we are sitting on your. Well, we're welcome to your veranda. Do you call it a patio or veranda? I call it a deck. It's a deck. Yeah. Maybe that's what you call it. South Australians might call them more decks. If it wasn't actually timber, you'd have to call it what? A, con- a concrete. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking at we're at, we're on your deck in your house at your house that's on yes. Your house. Um, and we're looking out, and what I want to do is I I interview my guests in their happy place. You know, what in the place that is um, and this is a pretty happy place because what we're looking at is is your, some of your vines, and there's a bit of a um, flow line there, riparian zone, a creek, um, just through there, and we've got birds chirping. And I heard some lambs barring and ewes yes. barring this morning. Yep, they're in the vineyard over there. They, oh, yeah, and, right. And, 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 and down here, because they sound yep. like they were down here. Yeah. Can't see them because they're sort of hidden. Hopefully eating all the weeds. We'll get to that. I I'm, want I'm to know more about that. That's really cool. So if you don't know, um, I haven't heard of Melissa Brown and Gem Tree Wines, and how dare you? How rude of our listeners not to. <laughs> So, Melissa, we're here and we're having a lovely time. I want you just to start by telling me, um, our listeners, you know, what it means to you to be sitting here looking at that beautiful part of the world. Oh. Is it nice? It's great. Um, I, it feels like I, I definitely belong here. So this was, mm. um, 
this was my parents' home uh, and um, I was very lucky that um, about 10 years ago they they decided to move um, and they let Mike and I move in here. Um, we actually got married on this deck cool. um, back in 2000 and back then I never even dreamed that I would end up living here. So, um, yeah, I feel very fortunate. Um, and I think living on the property um, that, that we farm, it's definitely given not only me a stronger connection, but it's giving our children a connection to this land, um, which we didn't have before we lived here. So, yeah. And you want to explain what, what, what's going on out there in front of us, where we are? Uh, sure. So we are in McLaren Flat, um, which is... Uh, a little village, part of the McLaren Vale region, just east of McLaren Vale. We're sitting at the base of the Mount Lofty Ranges, um, so it's um, we're surrounded by hills and trees. Um, a bit further west, we've got um, the um, St Vincent's Gulf, so we're on the Flurio Peninsula here. Um, we've got some absolutely beautiful um, coastline and, and beaches here. Um, I just love living where I do because um, I feel like I've got the best of everything, beautiful beaches, space, fresh air, beautiful nature, and we're 45 minutes from a capital city. Being Adelaide? Yes. Which yeah. you were you were there last night um, hosting a, a dinner. Correct, yes. Tell yeah. us why. why? <laughs> well, that was for Tasting Australia, um, which is a, a fantastic um, event run here in South Australia. And, um, yeah, all sorts of events are um, going on uh, during Tasting Australia. Obviously the focus is food um, but a lot on wine as well and um, Mike and I are actually attending an event ourselves this afternoon um, going to a, a master class of Cullen wines, which I'm very excited about. Mm, Cullen from uh, WA. Correct. Who yes. are also? Biodynamic mm. and her wines are amazing. They yeah. certainly are. Yeah. Um, so let's get to – we've set the scene somewhat. Um, it is beautiful here. It's funny when you turn up somewhere. We, I, I arrived the other night for dinner. Thank you very much. And um, it was dark, so we really didn't know, you know where, where I was. And then to be sitting here now um, with all this beautiful landscape exposed in the sunlight is, is just wonderful, and it is a magic, magic place. Melissa, um, I want to dig into your journey, your regenerative journey. Um, where do you want to start? Oh, well, probably not, you know, when I was born. <laughs> you might want to. Are you born around here? No, I was no. born in Adelaide. Adelaide, yeah. okay, sure. Yeah. In um, a hospital. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you might have been born at, I don't know, home. No, I wasn't. Mm. Um, my grandfather, uh, he was a market gardener in um, Marion, or, and his um, his father was a market gardener in Cherry Gardens. So. Um, my grandfather, when urbanisation was sort of increasing around Marion in the 1960s, he decided to come down here and he planted a vineyard in um, the year I was born, actually, which I kind of feel is reasonably significant. Um, so he, um, he continued to do his market gardening. Um, but, yeah, he, he started the whole vineyard thing. And then my parents, they came down here in the 80s and my grandfather, you know, taught my dad. Um, and mum and dad, they started with um, sort of a 30-acre vineyard. They were very hardworking um, and became quite successful. Um, and uh, they just gradually kept buying more vineyards and more land to plant. Uh, and then I joined our family business in, in the 90s. Um, so, um, and it was around that time that I met Mike. Um, so we were principally grape growers and very conventional grape growers too. Okay. And then when I met Mike, um, I brought a winemaker into the family, mm. um, probably one of the you best to, things. You had to marry him. Well, you? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My dad will tell you one of the best things I've ever done because, you know, mm. he loves drinking our wine now. Um, <laughs> uh, Hopefully for not, not that reason alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and then we, we uh, decided to, Mike and I decided to have a crack at making our own wine. So, um, yeah, we started with 500 cases in 1998 and that is when the Gem Tree brand 
was um, was born. And why gem tree? What's the, what's where's that? So that's from? the name of this beautiful property where we're sitting. Uh, um, so this property was actually owned by a group of investors, and my dad planted it for them. Uh, so they contracted him to um, to run it, and it started as a hundred acres. So they called it Gem Tree. Okay. Um, and then anyway, they went broke, and um, uh, Dad went along to the auction and didn't really have the money, but stuck his hand up and bought it. So. Because he knew how to run it, pretty much. Did he? Well, yeah, I think um, he, he obviously thought it was a pretty, a pretty mm. good bet, and mm. um, it was quite risky back then. It was sort of early nineties, and the industry was not, um, uh, wasn't cranking. Yeah, it wasn't developed. Yeah. And how many acres have you got now? We've got just over three hundred. Mm. Yeah. Well. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so, what happened? You and Mike took over. Um, what happened next? Well, made made the first. Yeah, so we made batch. the first uh, the wine, first vintage, which, which that's what you yeah, say, isn't and like, not batch. Um, my dad sort of said, "Well, you can't d- don't make too much because if you can't sell it, we're going to have to drink it all." Um, <laughs> but we did sell it. So yeah, um, nice. yeah so look, we gradually um, the wine brand started very small um, and and very slowly grew, um, but I think probably significantly. Um, I um, well, I started playing around with organics around 2005, and that came from a. Um, I had a personal experience where I attended a health retreat on Kangaroo Island, um, and I completely changed my whole viewpoint um, on the way I was living my life, and and it gave me a, a real focus and sense of purpose, and I became um, a big advocate for organic. Um, from that experience and so I started playing around with organics here in the vineyard and then um, Mike attended a a workshop in the Barossa Um, it was a Shiraz Alliance and uh, he he went to a a little tasting of biodynamic wines and came back and said to me wow these those wines were incredible Um, would you consider having a look at biodynamics and I went sure so um yeah, that's sort of how we, we got into it. And you went to the retreat um, uh, just because you wanted a new way of doing things or you I was a change bit, of I was a bit unwell mm. um, and, yeah, so it was um, – I've always suffered from migraines. Um, so that was sort of the um, – why I went. I actually ended up – I've been back to that retreat six times. So um, – the lady who runs it, she became sort of a bit like my guru, I suppose. Um, we, can we tell, tell people her, her name? Yeah, so it's Kangaroo <laughs> Island Health Retreat and mm. her name is Sue McCarthy. I've sent lots of people to her mm. over the years. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, she's a, um, a real force in herself um, and I've, I've learned a lot from her and, and she's had a significant impact on, on my life. Mm. Mm. And, uh, yeah, and, a, and, a, and a wonderful catalyst for change and then the, the journey on it went. Definitely. And I, I think um, it things are all about timing. Mm. Um, you know, like when I was growing up, I hated the vineyard. Um, I wasn't interested in nature or anything at all um, like that and I never, ever thought I would end up um, running my dad's vineyards. Um, but... Um, when I, in 94, I came back from overseas, I was at a bit of a crossroads and I sort of said to my dad, oh, um, I need a job, you know, broke. Can I come and work in the vineyard? <laughs> he said, um, uh, sure, you won't last two weeks because you're too soft. Um, <laughs> and, uh, well, dad. yeah, that was 23 years ago. So, but the, what I hadn't realised about myself prior to then was that, um, how much I love nature and how much I love being in nature. And I think the time was just right then when I decided, when I made that decision to, to work in the vineyard, the timing was perfect for me to discover that about myself. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I didn't even, I didn't uh, do any science subjects at school um, because I didn't think I was smart enough or, you know, I didn't have that belief in myself and, and it's ama- I, I'm still amazed that I ended up doing a science degree mm. and I actually, you know, have a degree in science. It's incredible. Yeah. Do you know what, what, what that might, why that might have been that you just didn't, didn't feel a connection? Was it, be, was, I don't know, was there something that was said or happened or 
just didn't resonate at the time. I just, I don't, I just didn't, I didn't realise it about myself, you know. Mm. Um, and I, I mean, life's a journey, and you, you know, I think it's just full of different discoveries. And mm. I discovered that about myself, and I'm so glad. And now I, I know that, um, you know, when I get a bit stressed and when things really start to get a bit out of control, I, I know I need to go out in nature and just reground myself. Um, How do you do that? Oh, uh, look, um, I try and find a, you know, a short holiday. I, I go to Kangaroo Island a fair bit. I love it there. The the landscape and the nature there is just absolutely stunning. Um, yeah, I, you know, the beach. I love the beaches around here. It could be as simple as after, a, you know, big day at work, just walking out here and taking off your shoes and walking on the grass, mm. you know, just re- reconnect to nature and be in a garden or in a beautiful natural setting and um, I feel like that's where I'm meant to be. And you only have to walk a couple more metres from your garden and you're in, in, the, in the vineyard. Yes, yeah, and I walk around the vineyard a lot too because, yeah, that's as I said, this, this, I feel like I belong here. Mm. Mm. Um, it's a kind of interesting thing, isn't it, that vineyards are straight, you know, everything's, well, not everything's straight, but, you know, lots of infrastructure, lots of um, – uh, straight lines, very military. Yeah. Well, yeah, it is in a way. It has mm. to be for a number of reasons, and it's 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 dare I say a monoculture of that of, of that. However, what you know, what I, the sense I get, and the sense I get from you know, I guess growers who are dare I say doing the right thing, whatever that means. You know, it's not just a monoculture. There's there's more to it, isn't there? There's the there's the, what's happening into row. There's the there's the bird life. There's the You've got sheep in your vineyard. Like yes. it's not not like a the, the the monoculture in the true sense of the word. It's actually like a the integration of we have got a commercial crop here, but it's permanent, mm. obviously. Yep. Perennial. Yep. And you are doing some pretty cool things to um to to, to still maintain and enhance biodiversity, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. And um uh there's plenty of benefits that have come from that. Um and it, it is quite a big focus of, of what I do. I, I do believe biodiversity is important to create um, an ecosystem that is in balance. Uh, and we actually, we have um, less pest and disease problems here now than when we were running the vineyards conventionally. Mm. Um, and I think there's a number of reasons for that. Let's, um, we'll get to that. But let's jump. Back a bit to so Mike came back and said, "I reckon we should give this a crack." What was mm. the next step? So we uh, we trialled it on a on a block of Tempranillo. Um, my dad was um, uh, pretty against it. Um, Did he you say thought, you told him? He thought <laughs> he thought we were going to send him into financial ruin. Um, and uh, I said, "Well, just let us trial it and see how we go." And so he was he was worried about yield and sort of that, yeah, that's definitely gonna be a waste of that that. That crop or that block or that whatever. Yeah, yeah. My dad was pretty traditional in his views and um, also dad really liked the vineyard to look good. Uh, so he was he would always um, uh, want it to be, you know, mowed in between the vines and, and have no, um, uh, no life under vine. So it all had to be a bare strip under vine. So, so, so there was um, tillage? Yeah, tillage, yeah. yeah, tillage and um, and a very heavy chemical regime. Um, so for weeds. Yeah, yeah. yep. So pre-emergent herbicides, um, a, a lot of um, uh, chemical fertilizers, a lot of superphosphate um, that we used to put out with the cover crops and things like that. So yeah, it was a pretty intensive input regime here. Mm. Mm. So you're doing your your um, your Kicking it off, you're experimenting, he's spewing. Yeah. Know, what, what's going to happen? <laughs> oh, yeah, a few arguments. But, yeah, I mean, we used to argue a lot um, about the vineyards. Um, Still? Not now. No, no we've got to a, a good spot now. Mm. But, yeah, there was um, – um, we didn't agree on a lot of things, yeah. So um, – but, look, M- Mike was backing me up um, – He's but, a big bloke too, so he wouldn't have <laughs> <laughs> He is, yeah. And my oh, dad's a little dad bloke. Go, oh, okay, you do what you want. <laughs> I, I, I get my height from my dad, Charlie, so, um, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, look. What, what, was, what, was, what did you do? You, 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 did you 
not, not we did to fence it off, or you just said, no, this is this area here is we're going to put some preparations out. Yeah, we did. Mm. Um, and uh, you know, once you take away the um, the herbicide, I it, you know herbicide, I think does a lot of damage and to the soil health. Um, and once you take that away, um, it's a really good start to repairing the soil and and letting some life come back into it. Um, but there was a, um, a, a another winery here in McLaren Vale that were already biodynamic, and that was Paxton Wines. Yeah. And um, my dad is a, a good friend of David Paxton, and so I think that helped me get it across the line with Dad because I was able to say to him, well, you know, Paxton wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't a good thing. And Some other weirdo doing it too. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just, it helped, I, you know, I've got a lot to thank David Paxton for, so, um, mm. yeah. No, no, and I, I don't mean that facetiously. It's just, yeah. you know, that's, I have, uh, a, well, when I changed what I was doing, one of what I did was I, I sort of um, identified the dad people and met, introduced him to people who were not dissimilar in age to him and, and sort of background. And he, I think that helped because he was going, oh, okay, well, maybe my son's not that so silly that if these guys are doing it, then that sort of kind of a yeah. kind of gives him comfort. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. So you um you put what did you do? What was your first thing? You went and got some five hundred or yeah, yep. So um you know started putting out the preps and I mean in. We had the one year trial, and then we somehow managed to let Dad. You know, he he, he let us go across this whole property here. So, mm. um, yeah, put out preps pretty intensively in those first few years. So we were putting out uh, four preps a year, um, and a lot of experimentation with um, weed control. Really, that that's the biggest thing when you um, convert to organic or biodynamic is getting your head around that weed management. And I think that's what stops a lot of people from um, uh, from converting because it, it's a real leap of faith and a complete change in the way that, that you, you're doing things. Mm. Mm. So what did you – so previously maybe mainly herbicide um, control and then mm. you uh, – what, what did you do? Well, um, so we, we had a dodge plough. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we were using that and, and, and then and the sheep – um, they were pretty significant, um, mm. but that required a fair bit of capital investment with fencing around the place. Sure. Um, but uh, yeah, so the sheep um, are fantastic. You know, while the vines are from sort of post harvest through to bud burst, they do an amazing job, and they became a very big part of um, of what we do here, and that they still are today. And and I think it's important to note um, that animals. Whether it's in a vineyard or it's in a horticultural situation, and certainly in grazing, because that's just what they do. Mm. That's, that's part of the without the without the sheep or cattle, there is no grazing. In a pastoral situation, um, the the cycling of fertility as an animal in an environment, you mm. know, who and we exactly um, is a and it's fresh. You know, yes, there's a lot to be said for composting, and that's you know, hopefully made with some other manures and things. But yes. But having that fresh, the, the biology of this land, going back out on that land, having been through an animal and, and um, you know, fermentation and rumination and lots of energy put into that manure, even, you know, sheep, um, that's a really positive thing. Spot on, yeah. yeah. Um, and there are some people who will say that, oh, but, you know, having sheep um, is causing compaction on your, on your land. But I would argue that, um, you know, the tractors are probably doing a bit more. Damage in that respect than, than having mm. sheep. What do you do with them when you're when they're not running around in the sort of cooler times of the so year? So we have to have um, paddocks where mm. we can put them in during the growing season. But um, we've only got about a hundred of our own sheep, which our vineyard manager Troy he, he owns the sheep, mm. um, and we have an arrangement with a farmer, um, sort of in the southeast, and he brings his sheep in here. They have to quarantine, and then they. Um, they're here over winter, so it's a it's a win win because um, his paddocks get a spell. He comes down with um, which uh, uh, ewes that are about to lamb, or you know we we might get lambs as well. And they lamb here, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, so his paddocks get a spell. They come down here, eat all of our weeds. He gets fat lambs back, and um, no money changes do you, hands. Do you whip a few under the freezer while they're here? Oh, I wouldn't do that. No. <laughs> 
No one's going to hear this anyway. So no, no. Well, see, we have um, Troy's sheep for that, so, yeah. <laughs> Does Troy know about that? Yeah. Well, he, he usually <laughs> does it, Charlie, so, yeah. So, how many, so um, how many hundreds do you end up sort of having to roam around the vineyard? Yeah, it's uh, quite a few, yeah. about four, you know, 400. Yeah, nice. Yeah. That's probably really small when, you know. No, 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 but, farmer, but, but, but you're no, but you're three hundred acres. So that's that's that's. I mean, and it's it's whatever you, is you need to do to get the outcomes you want. Well, and mm-hmm. what we found is that um, we have to put them into you know the cell grazing sort of scenario totally, where yeah. they have to go into smaller areas mm-hmm. to do a, an effective job. Totally. Yeah. So that that might mean running you know a type a bit of a fence down a vine row to temporary. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. What do you do? You, do you use a um, like Kiwi Tech fencing, or what do you or what sort of fence do you put Just, up? Just um, oh, look, they're, they're pretty rudimentary fen- yeah. fencing. Hot. Um, Hot wire. I'm really bad at um, closing the gates properly. Um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that's not helpful. <laughs> so are they are they hot wire? Are they as in they electrified? No, no, they're, they're not. They're like a netting gate, netting fence, are they? Um, yeah, it's just you know it's the sort of cyclone fencing, or we just use wire and yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. I'd love to have a look at what you do because sure. there there may or may not be. I don't know. I'm no expert in running cheap in vineyards, there might be ways to um, uh, be able to run um, uh, fences out that are more simple and <clears throat> and as effective. But anyway, let's, let's yeah. talk about that later. We, we have tried um, cows too in yeah. the past, but it, that was not successful. Because? Oh, they do a bit of damage, damage like they're yeah. sort of chewing on irrigation oh, yeah. lines and, yeah. you know, getting into valves and things like that. I'd, yeah. Yeah. No, they can be troublesome. And then they'd kind of get out and you'd find one down on the road. and Yeah, yeah not good. No. <laughs> but it's, yeah, better, if you're going to hit something on the road, better to be sheep than a cow. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Purely from an endurance point of view. Um, so tell me, so for, for lots of preparations, that, and that's generally your um, your regime at, uh, now still? No, so we, um, uh, we put two biodynamic sprays out a year. We just mm. do a spring and an autumn spray yeah. now. And what what is that? What what's in that preparation? Uh, oh, five hundred and the um the cow pat pit. Yeah, cool. Um, and and five hundred one. Um, yes, and that that's pretty much it. And so, for those who don't don't know yet, because you're about to find out, the five hundred and the cow manure concentrate or cow pat pit, um, is a soil preparation. So that's really for the. You know, that's right. The soil yes. Sort of activity. Yep. Yep. So that's it's um stimulating all the. All the microbes in the soil, um, they sort of start feeding and um, and then that creates, um, you know, humus and um, uh, just gets all that activity happening in the soil um, and, you know, then you have nutrients are released to the plant and, yeah, so you just, it's, that's how it should be, I think. And very fi- natural. Yes, totally. And the 501 is silica, horn silica. Yep. How do you use that in your thing? Because I think that's for... For um, a lot of people, and, and especially for, for for grape growers, I think a really important uh, tool that one can use. Absolutely. Well, so the um, I always describe, you know, the five hundred is all about what's happening below the ground. The five hundred one is sort of what's happening above the ground. It's more um, about encouraging photosynthesis, uh, sap flow, sugar accumulation. Um, uh, it, it can assist in ripening. It helps strengthen the plant against um, any any fungal diseases. Um, yeah. So the um, um, and if you're putting out 500, you should put out 501 as well. Um, otherwise, you're creating an an imbalance. The 501 is just as important as the as the 500. It, <coughs> excuse me. So the um, the 501 is going out on a sort of a in a sort of a scheduled way, is it more like, oh, I think we need to put a bit of that. No, <laughs> we, we, um, this, this today, this week. What's what's so, your sort of regime with it? Yeah, well, um, so we do our autumn, um, as I said, our autumn spray and our spring spray. Um, we we spray the five hundred when the moon is descending, and the five hundred one when the moon is ascending, um, and it generally happens in the same month. So. Um, yeah, that's how we do it. And you're using it um, uh, specifically for any um, like downy mildew or any mildew types of uh, thing? I haven't. Mm. Um, in 2017, we had a very wet um, vintage here mm. um, and we had big crops too. So it, 
in about around January of that year, I did put out a 501 on its own because um, I felt like it was going to help with the, that, that ripening process. Um, what I didn't do was leave a patch unsprayed. So, mm. um, you know, I didn't have a trial patch to compare against, but, um, you know, all of our crops successfully ripened and we didn't have any disease issues that year, um, which was a very wet year. So, yeah. When others may have had, it was a disease, sort um, of a disease uh, year. 2011 was actually a really bad year for disease. Mm. Um, and we were pretty early on in our journey. Um, we didn't lose um, any crops other than a small acreage. We had four acres of Sangiovese and we, we did lose that crop that year, but the rest of it we, we got through. Mm. Looking for more information to assist your regenerative journey? Come join Charlie and his guests around The Kitchen Table, an online community of supporters with exclusive access to the regenerative journey interview transcripts, live online Q&A sessions, a chance to engage with other like-minded people and more. Go to www.charliearnett.com.au forward slash The Kitchen Table and we look forward to sharing a yarn with you. Now let's get back to this week's episode. That, so that's become a, a you know a cornerstone of your um, your practice here at the farm since then. Totally, it yeah. is um, uh, the the philosophy that we have of running the, these vineyards. It, it's all about keeping it as natural as possible, uh, enlivening the soil, um, which you, you then gives you healthy vines um, and. Um, biodiversity um, and yeah it's it it's it is the focus of what what we do um, and then other things are, have come from that so um, we're really conscious about um, our, any decisions that we make how we can um, lessen the detrimental impact on the environment uh, so yeah it's um it's become a um, a very strong focus of our business to be um, uh, to to try and help the environment and mm. and to nurture this land and um, yeah, it's really important. To, and what are some of the other things you're doing that that sort of aren't necessarily grape related directly, but you're doing to nurture the land? Well, it's it's the biodiversity, um, but um, so we've got a um, an area in the vineyard called uh, it's right sort of in the middle of of our vineyards. It's called the Gem Tree Eco Trail. And that's it's a twenty-five acre piece of land that we have. Um, it was degraded, so when Mum and Dad bought that piece of land, it was um, uh, the only vegetation on it was some beautiful big gum trees, um, and we set aside an area to revegetate, um, and we um, we've, we've planted over fifty thousand native trees and shrubs in this area, uh, and we've. We've also put in a, a walking trail through there. It's just a, a short one-kilometre trail. Um, we've got informational signs in there teaching people about the environment. Um, and, yeah, that that area has, um, I mean, that is a, a perfect example of um, biodiversity. Um, it's become an, an important corridor for um, native, native animals. And, um, um, yeah, it's just a, a really fantastic space and um, something that um, is quite unique to Gem Tree and that we're quite proud of. Well, I, you should be proud of it too because you took us a quick spin there the other day. It was wonderful because yeah. we turned up to the car park, a couple of kangaroos just in the car park, already mm-hmm. parked themselves. Your dog was going nuts trying to round them up <laughs> or trying to. Um, you've got you've got some emus there. You've got um, a little little spot where people, um, there's an organisation that you work with that, that you know, um, uh, with Koala, Sort of um, rescue, sort of a yes. little spot. Yeah. So they get to hang out in a really cool. Yeah. Part so of the world. well, we we sponsor Southern Koala Rescue. So um, um, a couple Mission Wade. Um, they they do a huge amount of work um, rescuing injured koalas mm. ar- around here. Um, and yeah, I love the work that they do, and I really admire what they do. Um, and uh, I asked them if um, they needed an area. 
you know, to put koalas and they said, yep. So we set up just a little mm. um, fenced area where they put injured koala, an injured koala in there and it's um, uh, it's left there to get used to being back out in the mm. wild. We have to provide um, food and water for the for the koala and, and then when, when they're happy for it, that when they think it's ready, it'll then get released back mm. into the wild. You so. can shin up as big tree there and have like a pretty normal kind of hangout hospital time. It's, it's awesome. You know, it gets fed three different <coughs> species of eucalypt every couple of days and fresh water and, yeah, well, they never want to leave. That's the thing. When they open the door, sometimes it takes them three days to go because <laughs> the they're like, the, why would I go? They've been at the resort for ages. That's it. Um, and, and it's free. Like you have that, you people just turn, turn up and park and wander around. Yes. Which yeah. is really cool. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's... and there's a, there's a playground in there. Um, there's a... a a barbecue that people can use. Um, so it is a um, a great space for families to use the, the local community. A lot of people used to walk their dogs in there and weren't terribly happy when we said, no, sorry, because of the native animals, oh, yeah, sure. got to keep them out. But, mm. um, yeah, and it's just um, a, a really um, great place to go and be amongst nature. Um, we've been here for a couple of days now. This is the um, uh, second day, morning of the second day of our two-day biodynamic Introduction to Biodynamics that Hamish McKay and I run, so we're really um, very pleased and you know grateful that you've, you've you're hosting that for us, and it's really cool because we actually have, we're in in one of your sheds and the office uh, your um, what do you part what what do you call that part of your depot there? What is it called? Is it it's it's a winery? Called, um, it's a winery? No. Yeah. Where are we? It is the winery. Yeah. And we're in this big um, shed with the. You are. Cool we are eggs. hosting the um, the workshop in Narnia. In Narnia? Yeah. Because of why? Well, we called it Narnia um, because there used to be a um, a door mm. um, that you would sort of have to go through to, to get to that little area. Mm. Is that the one that's dead? It's sort of been... That's right. Oh, I was wondering, yeah. yeah, okay, sure. So it's like what's behind the door. What's behind the door, um, yeah. Yeah, that's so cool. that's... Um, and there's big black eggs, concrete, concrete eggs. Concrete eggs, yeah. So is, that, is that a secret? That Are we, are we, are no. we in the inner sanctum there? <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. If I taste that wine, will I just be magical or something? <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to, Charlie. Does uh, <laughs> I do? I need help. Um, it's really cool. Yeah, it is, and that's a fairly new addition to to what we're doing. Um, yeah, uh, those those eggs are very expensive, um, mm. and um, yeah, it's the the eggs um, are a great way of. Um, Infusing more creativity into wines, I think, um, and just giving them that little bit of oomph that you don't get from a, you know, a square fermenter. Or and also fermenter. not in – so if they're in concrete, then it's, they're not in oak. Correct. So they're not getting sort of oak yep. overtones. Yeah, that's right. And it's also the shape of the egg that um, has an impact because the wine is constantly sort of moving. Mm. Um, so – in a, in As a, opposed to a flat bottom or a correct. Sort of thing. So in okay. a in a in a barrel, the wine just sort of sits on the lees. Mm. Um, whereas in the egg, there is this slow movement happening all the time. So That's it's cool. constantly mix. The solids are sort of mixing. Mm. Yeah. So that's what imparts a slightly different flavour. And tell me, uh, Melissa, what um, for those um, grape growers listening? Mm -hmm. What are some of the I don't know, the, the things that you might be able to, um, tips and tricks or, you know, bits of wisdom you can impart that you have learnt, you know, learnt from your learning. So your sort of, you know, um, your, 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 your time, not just as, as a grape grower, but, you know, maybe more as a, as a biodynamic grape grower. What are some of the things that might um, instill confidence, inspiration? Uh, well, look, I mean, I, so I think, um, when we first converted um, to this regime, um, there was a, a bit of cynicism around it. Um, internally, you know, externally? Externally. Oh, and it was also internally, you know, it was um, convincing our team members that this was a good thing to do as well. It, um, uh, as, as I said before, um, I think weeds are a, a big stumbling block for people to get over in terms of going organic and, I mean, here here in McLaren Vale, um, we have the perfect climate for um, organic farming. We don't we don't generally get frost. We don't get a lot of sort of um, rainfall in in summer. We can get 
um, a fair bit of rainfall in spring, but not always. Um, so, and it, it, you know, so it, very different to the Hunter Valley, for example, where it's quite humid and, and, you know, they can get high rainfall around harvest. So it's pretty easy to be organic here. But um, I think, you know, if, I, if someone says to me, well, what are the benefits of, of um, going organic and biodynamic? It would be because, you, uh, you know, it's your soil health. The soils, um, you, you're not putting um, herbicides and artificial inputs into the soil, which um, for me, I'm, I'm dealing with nature. My job is um, working with nature. And the more that you work with it than against it or, you know, the more, the more things that you introduce to try and influence it, um, I, I just don't. It just doesn't feel right. You that that whole system should work naturally, um, and and it can. Mm. You know, I think we've successfully um, shown that it does work and that um, it is possible. Yeah, but you have to have that belief, and. Um, and make that leap of faith to say, right, this this is what what I'm doing now, and I'm not, you know, there are a few people out there that might say, oh yes, well we use organic practices, but they're not certified or, um, you know, they're not quite prepared to take that final step, commit because they want to have that fallback position. So when you say that they might be sort of, I don't know, doing some organic practices, but still throwing a bit of herbicide around or sort of, oh yeah, you know, or you know, they might think that. Um, yeah, it's just have, have sheep but use herbicide too or something. Yeah, sort of just in a, case. And I guess there's something that's something you know. I mean, everyone needs to go at their own speed to this sort of thing. But at the end of the day, I think you're you're right. I, you know, I, I definitely believe you're right at that. You know, there is a there is a point at which you do have to just commit or jump off that thing, and there is a degree of trust, isn't there? You know, definitely. You know, sort of hone your skills and 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 get a bit more comfortable with it. But you that's know, right. Yeah, and look, I've been very fortunate. So I've worked, um, I've, I've got quite a few people on my team that have been with me for a long time, in particular um, our vineyard manager, Troy, who we've been working together for 19 years. Mm. So um, he was, um, you know, here when we were running these vineyards conventionally and then when I said, okay, we're, we're going to go biodynamic, um, you know, he was like, whoa, well, how are we going to do that? But He's just come on the journey with us and um, he's, um, he's very talented at a lot of things and, you know, he, um, he's, he's sort of modified equipment and really good at problem solving and, and, and so it's great having um, somebody in your team who's really supportive of what you're doing and prepared to face those challenges. And um, so I've been very fortunate to have people around me um, that are, are supportive and and one thing we've realised is that now when we employ people here at Gemtree, um, we're looking for like-minded individuals. Um, so you know, we we no point somebody coming and working at Gemtree if if they don't believe in in our philosophy and the way that we're running our business. Um, it, it's not going to work. And you you've you've put uh, half a dozen more of your your employees or staff through our course at the moment. Which is wonderful. Yeah, well, it's it's important that the whole team um, understands what we do, why we do, even if they're working, you know, in admin. Um, yeah, and well, and also um, we run tours at our cellar door, teaching people about biodynamics. So um, if we if we're doing that, we need to know what we're talking about. You know, like those mm. um, the the team up there. Um, they're pretty passionate about it as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, so everybody in our business um, understands biodynamic. And, I mean, knowing you as much as I know of you and Mike and the family, you know, you're, I mean, I'm not surprised you're, you're, you're attracting good people, you know, the fact that, um, you know, and then they're staying. Troy, you, you, you transition. I mean, I've no doubt that Troy is a, um, you know, his type of personality is obviously one open minded and, 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 and trusting and but at the same time, um, you know, you're obviously be able to you're obviously you and Mike are able to hold his hand through that and, and, and work in a very, you know, close way to get that happen. So definitely you know. collaboratively mm. and I um we we're not the sort of um business owners or bosses I suppose that say, right, you will do this. We 
um, we recognise that we're going to get um, the best result by um, having input from mm. all the team members about, you know, what, what might work, what doesn't, um, mm. and, and getting them to introduce ideas and solutions. I feel like they've got some ownership of it. Exactly, yeah. Um, just turning back to your cellar door, we, you, you gave Hamish and I a, um, a tour of your wonderful, it's basically your biodynamic sort of prep making and, and demonstration area. It's awesome. Thank Can you, you take us through that? Because I've never, we've never, we've never, I've never seen that before. It's really cool. Yeah, that's, I was a bit nervous um, showing Hamish around because, you know, Hamish, I, I learnt a lot from Hamish, mm. and um, but he liked it, so that's good. I got a tick. Happy about that. <laughs> he loved it. <laughs> Tell us about it because we haven't seen it before. So it's it's an area that um, we've established um, an interactive area mm. to show people and explain to people how biodynamics works. Because we found that um, trying to talk across a bar um, about the philosophy, um, it, it, it's very difficult mm. to communicate the message properly. So we, we wanted to set up a little area where people can um, look at the sort of, you know, herbs that are used by growing them in the gardens, um, uh, have examples of the preparations. They can see them, they can smell them, they can touch them. Um, we've got the flow form there so they can see that in operation and, and just talking people through it. Um, and, um, and we even finish off the tour by just a little quick walk out to the vineyard. and um, So people are immersed in it a bit mm. more and most people who have um, done the tour, um, well, actually I think everybody who's done the tour has, has really enjoyed it and come away a lot more educated um, and with a lot more knowledge about biodynamic. And it also puts the, the wine into context, doesn't it? Like you guys are, uh, uh, you know, the wine is an expression of yeah. the soil and the parental material, and that's one thing. The grape is produced You're using the biodynamics to sort of get it to that stage and yes. and people can understand it. A bit of work goes into it, doesn't it? I mean, it's, when I say work, is like, there's much intent. There's much about the attitude. That it? is absolutely the intent, and that you know that's why it's important that our team um, understand. Like you know, there's no point in me saying to someone, "Oh, well, you go and put out that biodynamic spray," if they don't understand mm. what they're doing. Because, yep, um, the the philosophy you do have to have that intent, mm. that good intent, um, in order for it to work. So there is a bit of Mm, spirituality um, mm. and that sort of um, – it's not mainstream, clear-cut science, yeah. It's not very – it's not get your spray regime or your, your inputs from your agronomist and sort of bang it out and, it's and, far and from it just that. being a prescriptive type of type of thing. Mm. Any other um, tips or, you know, I don't know, things that you can impart to our listeners and our, our other grape growers? Oh, uh, look, I uh, – I think um, I I just feel like there is so much going wrong on our on our planet, you mm. know, um, and I think that we all have a responsibility to to try and do something, um, and if everybody does something in changes their practices in some way to help the environment, um, then collectively we can we can help to. Re- to repair mm. and and make things better, um, and so that that is kind of what um, what drives me because I'm really concerned for the future of our planet. And so what we're doing here is trying to set an example um, of how you you can run a business um, successfully and do it while looking after the environment. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's that would be my. That, that sort of a theme came up the other uh, Wednesday. I did a lunch at our Kina Wine Estate in the Barossa and it was a Tasting Australia event. And our question was was sort of that, you know, what what are you, the, the climate crisis, what can we do? And, and um, I just sort of said, well, uh, as a farmer, yeah, we shouldn't think we need to save the planet because that's a big job. It but is. what we can do, and, uh, and often people will go, oh, that's too hard, I'm not going to bother and I'm just going to sit here being anxious and pained by it, which in itself is kind of weird. But you know, I just said, I know what you mean, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I thought, well, you know, let's, as, a, as farmers or managers of landscape, um, 
just focus on what we're in control of and the boundary of our farms and, and what's going on there and understanding the function of that landscape and doing things, whether it's biodynamics or natural seconds farming or, I don't know, some managed grazing or planting trees or God knows what, bird habitat sort of Even, focus. Even, you know, take your keep cup to the coffee shop. And, yes, um, when you head into town for smoke. Yeah, and, just the little things. Everything's <laughs> going to have an impact. And and, and keep, it, keep it simple and keep it sort of within your... Your your your, your capability, capability, your capacity, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think um, David Attenborough summed it up really well when he said, "If we take care of nature, nature will take care of us." Really, and that's you know, there's a lot of um, wisdom in that statement. And considering that our that nature is our most valuable, powerful um, business partner, because we're in business with nature. Of really. At the end of the day, we we, we have a commercial. Yeah, business operation. Where, where, and um, yeah, because uh, you know, um, ecology can't survive without the economy, and and the economy can't survive without ecology. Oh, so. yeah, that's it. Yeah. Tell me, um, you sort of didn't touch on it, but I'll. Well, anything yeah, are you are irate about anything at the moment, Melissa? <laughs> You're not very irate kind of person. I'm but not. Is, it, is anything any underlying that's just. Oh, it's, it's no, it's just a, a, a concern. Um, but what I, I, I am buoyed by the. There is a lot more focus on the environment and climate change now, and um, people are really starting to take notice. And I think you know, even a couple of years ago, there were people that said, "Well, it's not, it's not happening. It's not." I, I mean, um, it is. It is an issue, and um, I think people are really. Realizing that if we don't do something now, I mean, already the damage is there's a lot of damage that's been done. Um, but yeah, I think governments around the world are starting to um, to do stuff. So, so that's that's good. I mean, no point me sitting back and getting angry. What's that going to do? <laughs> you know, it's like me worrying about the weather. I know I, I used yeah. to worry a lot, and yep. now it's like, well, what's that going to do? I can't mm. change. I, I can't do anything about it. Well, let's flip that around. What are you excited about at the moment? Oh wow! Um, well, that that movement of mm. you know the the engagement of people, and I think COVID um, has been a, a real reset too for a lot of people of um, realizing what's important um, and just being grateful for small things. Um, and I think there's been a, a lot more focus on the in, environment from COVID. Um, so yeah, I'm. I, I, this just seems to be a big movement um, mm. towards people living their lives more consciously. And they all still need to eat food. Well, that absolutely, and, and, and that is wine. such a you know that that's one of the things that really attracted me to the biodynamic philosophy was that um, you know Steiner said that um, we as farmers have a responsibility um, to nurture our community by. Um, growing produce that is um, full of nutritional value, which then feeds the the brains of people within your community, and then everything is going to fall into place. Um, and I think that's probably um, where there's been a lot of things going wrong in society is because of the food that people eat and mm. they're not getting that um, nourishment that they need. And that affects us, you know, mental cognitive function, yeah, emotions. Attitude, totally, yeah. Know, perspective on life, exactly, yeah. It's kind of important that food, isn't it? Very, yeah. <laughs> Do yeah. it. Well, and having um, the the right framework to grow that fruit, that food. Mm. Um, so, protecting um, our natural assets and and making sure that we're nurturing them and not not denigrating them. Um, Melissa, any projects that you're involved in, or you, you're sort of, you know, um, again excited about that? That sort of, you know, you you've got a bit of a focus on at the moment. Sort of, it could be sort of on farm or elsewhere. Um, well, I'm part of um, the McLaren Vale Biodiversity Group. Um, I'm on that committee, and um, they're a group of um, very um, hardworking, dynamic individuals, and and our mission is to. Um, remove woody weeds from creek lines and, and replant um, with natives. Um, and we do that um, by partnering with landholders and then engaging um, volunteers. We have a field day once a month 
Um, but for two hours, and we, we might get 50 to 60 volunteers come out and work on a, on a property. Um, and um, we're achieving some um, amazing results of removing uh, these woody weeds. There's a lot of olives in our region that yeah. are, are, you know, a, a pest, and th- even things like. And there's other, you know, weeds, bone seed, and um, well, there's heaps of them. But um, yeah, trying to remove them and, and get the land back to what what used to be there. So those yeah. olives have sort of escaped, have they? Is that what they, are they? They have, and they're very, very difficult to control. Um, well, just they, they don't. They just don't like dying. They're hard to kill. Yeah, yeah. So we we do a lot of drilling and filling. Filling, drilling, drilling, mm. as in oh, and you poison mm. the poison. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then when they're in the right place, they're pretty. It's pretty good that they don't want to die, isn't it? <laughs> well, I've got a little olive grove. I know. Yeah, that, that down there that my mum planted, and yeah, um, yeah so. Um, and you're experimenting with that. You said the other day you, you've chopped. Yes, yeah. So we're going. <laughs> just like, to, yeah. They're just gone. There's like what two foot, maybe a foot. Yep. Of so we've just chop them off, and we're going to. This is Troy's idea to um, a spalier. Um, mm. put them, yeah, and and then we can um, hopefully machine harvest them. Yeah, awesome. Because um, at the moment we hand harvest, which is quite labour intensive. Can you shake them? Or yeah, so you can. You can. Yeah. Like, but as they are now. Like you know, uh, no, not put, with, put we a, can't fit a machine down the rows at the moment. So, uh, um, yeah, so it's all done by hand and with a shaker. Yeah, yeah. What if you just chop the sides and left what's there in some sort of no, a parallel? But then you've still got to, you know, put the tarps underneath and yes, get, yeah. No, we have tried to do it with the machine unsuccessfully. No, but, but like actually chop, chop them, espalier them as they are now without chopping them off at the No, trunk. I don't, no. Wouldn't work? That won't work, no, because you're sort of putting them on a trellis, effectively. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, you could do one or two and see what happens. Well, you know, we, there are a lot of trial and error that goes mm. on around here, Charlie, so yeah. <laughs> um, and I had, oh, uh, mentoring. Who were some of your mentors in your world or, you know, or, or, or more specifically the, the farm? Um, so I was um, fortunate enough to work with um, Pam Dunsford, who was the winemaker at Chapel Hill. Um, I worked with her in the mid-90s. I used to work at the cellar door there. And Pam was one of the – I think she was actually the first female winemaker in South Australia. She, um, you know, she was the only female to go through Roseworthy amongst – um, all these men back in the 60s. Which, and Roseworthy is... is, is I guess. Well, that was the big agricultural college here in yeah. South Australia. And there was a, there was a um, viticulture course yep. Yep. there. Yep. Yeah, cool. So, um, and, and Pam was a very um, straight down the line, um, very talented winemaker, very successful, um, and she was running Chapel Hill. And I think, you know, so... Um, uh, there weren't a lot of females um, in in viticulture back then, um, and it was great for me to work with somebody like Pam and see, um, you know, she was a trailblazer in herself, and um, yeah, so she had a bit of an influence on me because um, it's great to see, you know, people who, um, who have done things outside the square and and. You know, faced up to a challenge and and been successful. So, um, I was lucky enough to work with her, and um, yeah. Look, I mean, I the McLaren Vale community in itself is a very um, collaborative, um, encouraging community to be amongst. So, even though we, um, as the, all the wine businesses are kind of you know compete with each other. Um, we rec- we recognise that collaboratively we are going to achieve more for our region than if we're all trying to do it alone, mm-hmm. and so there's a lot of information sharing that goes on of you know of free will amongst growers and um you, you know uh, we regularly have field days here where growers are invited out to everybody else's properties to have a look at um, what people are doing, um, so. Um, you know, you could say that all of those people are kind of mini mentors because you know you can learn from everybody. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? It happens at, at Burua, um every few months. There's a grazing group there that that sort of chuff around at different properties, and it, 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 it they can they travel you know reasonable distance an hour or, or and a half too. It's quite a large area that sort of they roam around and and uh, they've been to Hanamino a couple of times uh, um, over the last few years, and 
And that, and even in the days when we were conventional farming and there was a, a top croppers group, and we would do that. We'd turn up at a shearing shed and we'd talk about what we're doing and it was the most amazing. It was, I, I learned the most. Well, that's sure. where you do learn from, you know, because it's all from experience. Mm. And if you haven't had that experience, somebody else has and they can tell you about so it. So if you're making a mistake or spending money you didn't need to. And yeah, all and those you get things. more from that than I think from reading it from a book. Yeah. Talk about reading books. Any any that you, um, you know, again, would, would recommend to people um, growing grapes or, you know, I don't know, biodynamics or farming or any uh, sort of standouts for you? Um, look. To be honest, I don't. I wish I had more time to read mm. books. Um, I listen to your podcast if I want to learn something, Charlie. Um, <laughs> oh, that's but, my next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, what biodynamic book I read? Um, Grass the Nettle by Peter Proctor. Yeah, yeah, cool. That was that's a, bi- a that's one of the one Bibles yeah. to start with. And and Maria Tun, her book, yeah, um, is very enlightening. Yeah, mm. um, they're both biodynamic practitioners. I think they're both. Both passed away. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, yeah. they certainly left a wonderful legacy. Uh, and and Peter um, is a is a great um, uh, doco, and I always get it wrong. It's it's one 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 cow, one man, one planet. But it's those three things, but maybe around different 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 order. Look it up, um, Google and YouTube, or whatever you do, because it is a wonderful story, and it just really really helps emphasize the, I guess, the power and the the the, um, the application of of biodynamics and a, and a really wonderful man too. I love the way he, in, in it. Have you seen it? No. Oh, he'd love it. He he he. Say New Zealand Kiwi, and he and he leaves he, when he leaves his home in New Zealand to travel to India. Did a lot of work in India. Really paved the way for a lot of biodynamic, um, uh, you know, uptake in India. And he would sing to his house. His, he and his wife would sing to their house to thank them for having been there. And we're, we're going away, going away for a bit, and we're going to come back soon. Fantastic. It's beautiful, yeah. We we do it, not a dissimilar thing at home where we have a little gong and and um and I set I set it up in front of the heater and the heater's hydro hydro something you know hot um, you know the water gets piped around the house so I'm thinking that the vibration gets gonged down through the rest of the house Amazing. and just go bang and just say a nice couple of gratefuls for for the shelter and the sanctuary that it provides. Beautiful. Um but no, I, and that was inspiration um, from that move from Peter doing that and it's um it's lovely. Um, Melissa, I'm conscious of time. We um, uh, we're sort of in the middle of the day two of the um, we are. Biodynamic I, I intro. wouldn't mind getting back there. I know. <laughs> and um, Hamish is talking about um, because you're the host, he can give you some extra lessons, I'm sure. Um, but I'm we might wrap it up. Um, and I can't tell you how um, grateful we are to be here. Um, for, for your hospitality, your and Mike and the team's hospitality. Stoked that you've got your some of your team members um, at the course and just um, lovely to be sitting here in the McLaren Vale looking at the flock of galahs flying over there. Your compost is just down there too. We had a look at yesterday. Yeah. Um, that was awesome and just sitting here in this beautiful part of the world and having a chat with you. It's been, well, been awesome. Yeah, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure um, for, for us to have you and Hamish here. So, yeah, thank you. We might come back. I hope so. Uh, even if we don't get invited, we're just going to turn up. <laughs> <laughs> well, Please at least do. turn up to the cellar door and taste some wine. For sure. It's the least yeah. we can do. Thanks, Missa. That was awesome. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Charlie. And next week's episode is with Rebecca Sullivan. I caught up with Rebecca uh, with her partner, Damo, uh, on their little farm at the Clare Valley in uh, South Australia a few months ago. We chatted about her life, um, her food advocacy and you know, campaigning in, uh, dare I say, activism, <clears throat> excuse me, act- activism in that space. And she's just fantastic, so passionate, um, passionate about Indigenous food, um, local food systems. Uh, she's a wonderful cook. Uh, and it was just a delight to sit with her on, on the veranda outside their uh, farmhouse um, on their farm and the Clare Valley, where they're doing some uh, and planning for some amazing uh, habitat restoration and uh, potentially the production of some in- Indigenous foods there. And uh, look, I hope you enjoy uh, listening to this episode of The Regenerative Journey as much as I did recording it with Rebecca Sullivan. This podcast is produced by Rhys Jones at Jaeger Media. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.